This is Join Us in France, episode 182. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, its many quirks, its history, its language, and, of course, destinations in France you want to learn about because, hopefully, you'll be visiting soon. Join Us in France is brought to you by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the small group tour company for people who want to experience the best out of their visit to France. We have a tour coming up late May with a few spots left for Paris and I can take one more person for Normandy. We'll be in Normandy over the D-Day celebrations and everything is selling out really fast. If you're interested in either the Paris or the Normandy tour, make up your mind quickly because it's time to book the hotel rooms and the tickets for both May and June. Also, if you want to join us for a day trip to Versailles on May 25th, book it fast because that's going to be full soon too. You can look at all of that on addictedtofrance.com. Quick announcement about the email extras. I haven't sent one out the last three weeks because I didn't have any inspiration and I only want to send you stuff if I think it's going to be helpful to you. In that time, lots of new people joined the email list and I welcome them. They probably wonder why I don't email them. Well, I'm about to send you another extra this weekend. It will be a graphic that shows the Paris historical access with a list of all the monuments that are included. You'll be able to print it as a reminder for when you eventually visit Paris. Because, I mean, I know you listen to the show with bated breath and you memorize everything I say. (laughs) But come on. You forget stuff, right? So you can print the episode overview and bring it to Paris with you when you'll need to look at it. On today's episode, I want to ask you a deep philosophical question. If Paris monuments all precisely line up over eight and a half kilometers and nobody knows about it, do they really line up? And more impressively, if I tell you about it, can I make them magically line up? But yes, lots of monuments line up in Paris and I'm going to show it to you. Warning, once you see this, you can never unsee it. Yet it's the type of completely arcane knowledge about Paris that will probably never come in handy And yet, I bet you'll go looking for it next time you're in Paris because it's cool. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Paris Historical Axis. The what? The Paris Historical Axis or Axe Historique de Paris, also known as La Voie Royale, the Royal Road. A select number of French people such as myself, of course, know about Lac Historique de Paris, and it's something you can go see in person when you visit Paris. I'll tell you exactly where to stand to see it later in the episode. You might be familiar with the Washington, D.C. axis. Designed by French-born architect Pierre-Charles L'Enfant, The idea is to line up major monuments to organize the city around a strong radiating avenue, symmetry, straight lines, order, power, you know, all of that. L'Enfant did not invent the concept of lining things up. He imported it from France, where it had been a big deal for a long time already. Washington, D.C. does it, and so do New Delhi. Canberra, Buenos Aires, and possibly many others that I don't know about. Lining things up perfectly is really hard. I know this is trivial, but 
A few years ago, I replaced an old fence along one side of my house. I decided I needed to get off the computer and do something manual for once. And how hard could it be? It's just a wooden fence. Yeah, no. The first section of my fence is so crooked, it's awful. I got better with practice, but straight lines are not something that happened without effort and know-how. On a much bigger scale, when we line things up in a city, we're saying, look at me, I'm so good, I can line things up that are very far from one another. In the case of the Paris Historical Axis, the monuments are 8 plus kilometers away from one another. If it looks aligned from the sky, that proves human intelligence, right? Yes, probably. People, even the ones without OCD, like to line things up. And, of course, Paris also went through the Haussmannian era of cutting through the clutter of narrow, messy old streets to get straight, wide avenues that crisscross Paris in many directions. So even when it's hard to do, cities sometimes decide to bite the bullet and do painful improvements just to be able to show off wide, gorgeous avenues. But Paris started on this project in the 1500s, when the city was still in its infancy, relatively speaking, So at least when it comes to the Paris historical axis, they didn't have to destroy anything to pull it off. Well, revolutionaries destroyed things, but they do that. I mean, we knew it. So let's start with the list of monuments that are lined up today, and then we'll go into how it happened. When people go to the Louvre, they are dazzled by the whole setting and that amazing glass pyramid by Pei. It just draws the eye like you wouldn't believe. The pyramid is at the center of the large plaza called Cour Napoléon. Now, try to ignore the pyramid for a minute in your mind's eye and look to the right a little bit. There's a statue of a man on a horse there. On the horse is Louis XIV in full glory, and that statue is the starting point of the Paris historical axis today. Extra credit for trivia. That statue is made of lead and not bronze because it's a replica that dates from 1988. They put the original, which was made of bronze, inside of the Louvre. There was another original copy of that statue of Louis XIV on a horse at Versailles in the garden. And that one too got put indoors inside the Orangerie at Versailles and replaced by a replica. At any rate, the Paris historical axis starts at the Louis XIV statue in the courtyard of the Louvre. It's also a great meeting point if you need to meet someone in Paris because it's easy to spot and it doesn't normally draw a crowd. At the other end of the Paris historical axis is the Grand Arche de la Défense. I'll talk to you more about that at the end of the episode. And I'll tell you also how it's going to be extended again beyond the Grand Arche at the end. So, we start at the statue of Louis XIV at the Louvre. Then we go through the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. Then through the gardens of... Then through the gardens at the Tuileries. Place de la Concorde and the Luxor Obelisk. The Champs-Élysées. The Arc de Triomphe. The Avenue of the Grande Armée. The Avenue Charles de Gaulle. It goes across the River Seine with... A proper bridge. I'll tell you how it wasn't always so. It's called the Pont de Neuilly. And then it gets to La Défense. The thing is, these landmarks did not appear in that linear order. And I want to tell you about that. How did this whole thing happen? Well, let's go back in time to see if we can figure it out. It would be cool if I could tell you about a grand plan by the Knight Templars or the Illuminati or something grand like that, where they looked far into the future to make Paris the center of the universe or something. Well, 
some of the material I read in preparation for this episode certainly hint at some grand plan of universal importance. One person saw vital significance in the angle of the axis compared to the geometry of the Earth. I really can't do it justice here because it was pure nonsense. But it gave me the idea to teach you a wonderful French expression. In the French tip of the week later on, the expression is tiré par les cheveux, which means far-fetched. So if there was no grand plan, what was it? I think it was really mundane. The construction of the first part of the Louvre started in 1546. French kings, who lived at the Louvre, liked to go hunt in the forest called Saint-Germain-en-Laye. It's 20 kilometers away to the west. And they decided that they needed a straight road to go hunting. Much of this area was farmland, uh, forest, swamp, and it had a nice straight road in the middle. And when their straight road got to one of the two meanders of the River Seine between Paris and the forest at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, they built one of these boat contraptions that crosses a river in a straight line. It's pulled by a rope or a cable. It's called a bac in French, but I don't know what to call it in English. It's like a raft with cables or ropes, and it starts at one bank of the river and pulls you to the other side with your horse or your carriage, or whatever. I'm sure one of you... I'm sure one of you knows the name of it and will tell me what it's called, but I couldn't find it. In any case, the straight road is how this whole thing started. They called it the Royal Road because kings wanted it and kings used it. So that's why if you've heard of the Paris Historical Axis at all, you may have heard it mentioned as the Royal Road. When Catherine de' Medici came into power that was middle of the 1500s, she commissioned a palace for herself just a little west of the Louvre. It was called the Palace of the Tuileries, Palais des Tuileries. It isn't there anymore because it was set on fire voluntarily during the Paris Commune in May 1871, and the damage was so extensive that they decided to demolish it and move the government to the Élysée Palace, where it is still today. I'll put a photo on it on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 182, so you have an idea of what it looks like. I'll put lots of photos. It's a, You need to visit because a lot of this stuff is visual, and the podcast isn't visual. The center of the Palace of the Tuileries, now gone, was the point of origin of the Paris Historical Axis. At first, Catherine de' Medici also liked gardens, and the Tuileries Gardens were developed just for her. Later, after her death, André Le Nôtre redesigned her Tuileries Gardens to include straight lines that extended far to the Champs-Élysées. But of course, under Catherine de' Medici, Paris pretty much ended right at the end of the Tuileries Garden. The rest was swampland, it wasn't developed, but they started draining that swamp, and since the Seine River is so close, all they probably had to do is build a wall or some walls to keep the water inside of the riverbed instead of letting it overflow everywhere. The River Seine is very high and flooding many areas as I record this episode on January 31st, 2018. So yeah, in wet countries like France, you have to use engineering methods to keep the rivers within their path or they'll constantly flood the area, making the nearby land really unusable. I mean, and within Paris, by now we have walls everywhere. It's just when you get out of Paris that the river isn't as kept within its path as it should be. But back to my Paris historical axis. There's a bit of mystery to me about some parts of the chronology of when these landmarks uh, were placed along the axis. While the Palace of the Tuileries was still there, 
That was the center of the Paris historical axis. But once it got destroyed, which didn't happen until 1871, they had to replace it f with another starting point, And they decided on the statue of Louis XIV on a horse near where the Louvre pyramid is today. But of course, Louis XIV was way before the revolution. So was that statue in the alignment to begin with? Or did they have to move it, to put it in the alignment after 1871? I couldn't find that information, but it's not that important. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but that's an open question. Now let's talk about André le Notre. I mentioned him earlier. Louis XIV, so that's middle of the 1600s, he had a genius garden designer called André le Notre. He's the one who modified the Catherine de' Medici gardens the, at the Tuileries to be all straight lines, and he extended the perspective to the Champs-Élysées. He also designed the gardens at Versailles and many other places. He made the whole concept of French gardens a huge thing. As Paris grew, people started building beyond the Tuileries gardens, all the way to the top of the Champs-Élysées. And strangely enough, the Champs-Élysées were designed, funded, and built before the Place de la Concorde, even though you may remember that the Place de la Concorde is between the Tuileries Garden and the Champs-Élysées. And it's a big area, it's 21 acres. For a long time, there was no grand plan for the area we now know as Place de la Concorde. It has changed names many times. And it went through many iterations, as happens everywhere. Le Notre planned and built the Tuileries and the Champs-Élysées, but when he died in 1700, he hadn't planned anything for the Place de la Concorde area. For most of the 1700s, there was a dock on the Seine River where they brought in marble from quarries all over France and probably Italy and Spain and all of that. That dock was right where the Place de la Concorde is today. <laughs> And marble was a big business. That's probably one of the reasons why they left the area alone. There was also a gabelle tax post. Gabelle is um, it's a tax on salt. And loveliest of all, there were two big open sewers that served the Champs-Élysées and the Tuileries. And they went right down into the river. <laughs> yeah, um, Paris has cleaned up a lot, thank goodness. In 1753, they organized an architectural competition to make something nice of this mixed-use, yucky area that we today know as the Place de la Concorde. And 10 years later, they've moved all these businesses, they've covered the sewers, and they placed a grand statue of Louis the 15th, this time, not the 14th, but the 15th, on a horse again. And of course, they placed that statue in the axis of the Tuileries Gardens and the Champs-Élysées. So again, they continued aligning things on purpose. There are two Arc de Triomphe in Paris. The construction of both started in 1896, and they were both erected to the glory of our favorite megalomaniac, Napoleon. Yes, Napoleon needed two monuments to his glory, built at the same time, and both on the Paris historical axis. That goes without saying. So the first Napoleon Arc de Triomphe is near the Louvre, and it's called the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. It's half the size of the other one that's on top of the Champs-Élysées. But it is twice as cute, so I think you should go look at it. It's got lovely green and, and four lovely pink columns. It's Corinthian style. They completed that one really quickly within two years. And it was used as the backdrop for impressive military shows that Napoleon liked so much. Today you can look around. It's a nice quiet area, great for photos and another good place to meet people in Paris because you can't miss it and it's quiet. The second Arc de Triomphe in Paris is the Arc de Triomphe de l'Étoile. And that one is at the top of the Champs-Élysées. It's twice as big as the other one, 50 meters tall. And they also started building it in 1806. But that one took 30 years to complete. So it wasn't inaugurated until 1836. And of course, the Paris historical axis goes right through the center of it. 
You can climb to the top of the Arc de Triomphe. I've never done it because I didn't get around to it when I was younger and now I have bad knees. But the view from the top is interesting. If you go, pay attention to the madness of the traffic going around that roundabout. It will look like chaos to you, but it's actually following the rules of right-hand side priority that we've discussed in episode 16 of the podcast. And this is a prime example of why I don't recommend visitors drive in Paris. People who learn to drive in France, like myself, we know what to do with these roundabouts, but others are completely flustered and it gets kind of dangerous. Two monuments were added to the Paris historical axis in 1836. The first in July 1836 and the second in October 1836. So the first is the Arc de Triomphe de l'Étoile that is on top of the Champs-Élysées that I just talked about. It was inaugurated in July 1836. The second is the Luxor Obelisk. They raised the Luxor Obelisk on the Place de la Concorde on October 25th, 1836, and they had planned all along to line it up with the center of the Tuileries Gardens and the Paris Historical Axis. It's uncanny how well these things line up. So how far apart are these landmarks on the Paris Historical Axis? So the Jardin des Tuileries proper is one kilometer long. But between the Louis XIV statue and the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, that's probably 500 meters, give or take. Then you get the Tuileries Garden, a, a kilometer. Then to the Luxor Obelisk, another 500 meters. Between the Obelisk and the Arc de Triomphe on the Champs Elysees, that's another two kilometers. And then there's a big jump, four kilometers to the Grand Arche de la Défense. So when you're standing at the Louis XIV statue, you may not notice the alignment. I don't think it's easy to see from there. It's easier to see it from the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. But if you can, you know, send me photos of, of what you see, because, you know, I'd be interested to see if you can find it yourself. Then the next major landmark is the Arc de Triomphe, and that's you know, three kilometers away from the uh, Arc du Carousel. And the Arc de Triomphe is 50 meters tall. So the, again, it's fairly easy to see because it's twice as tall as the previous two monuments uh, on this historical axis of Paris, where it gets tricky to see it without looking from high up is the next monument, uh, La Grande Arche. If you're standing in front of the Carousel, you are eight kilometers away from La Grande Arche and even though La Grande Arche is tall, you know, it's 110 meters tall, eight kilometers is, uh, is just too far. So the only way to see it is a drone, and they won't let you fly a drone in Paris, so... Oh, well. The size of monuments on the Paris historical axis get bigger and bigger, and that's how it works, right? If you have a perspective, you need to make the back bigger, otherwise you can't see it. The Louis XIV statue is kind of small. I mean... I couldn't find the exact size of it, but it's probably six to eight meters tall. Then the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel is 20 meters tall. The Obelisk is 23 meters tall. And the Arc de Triomphe is 50 meters tall. And that's what makes the alignment fairly easy to see, at least between the two Arc de Triomphe. So what's the best place to see the historical axis of Paris? Well, I think you should go in front of the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, when the green horses are facing you on a clear day, you can see the Luxor Obelisk really well and the Arc de Triomphe beyond. I suppose you might see the Grand Arche de la Défense, but it's eight kilometers away, like I said, and that's probably a stretch. I've never been able to see it. Oh, while we're talking about the Grand Arche, let me address this. Is it worth a visit? My answer is no. Unless they make significant changes in the future, it's not worth schlepping all the way there just to see the inside of a modern building. The Grande Arche was added in 1990. It hasn't aged well. You can get in an elevator to go to the top. Um, you can see Paris from up there. It'll cost you 15 euros. They often have minor exhibits, never anything important. They cost a few euros more. 
You know, I've been there to the Arche de la Défense a few times for work, and I know they have a cool Christmas market on the plaza in front of the Grand Arche. Those are good reasons to go, but just going to see it, in my opinion, it's not worth it. How's the view from the top of the Grand Arche? Well, it's cool, but you are eight plus kilometers away from the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, and it's way too far for most eyeballs or zoom lenses even. I went up to the roof once. I, you know, I never need to do that again. By comparison, the Tour Montparnasse is only three kilometers away from the Eiffel Tower. The view is better from there, but even there, to get a decent photo, you need like 200 millimeters. You need a 200 millimeter zoom lens. So, you know, go if you really want to, but it's not a must do. So in conclusion, there you have it, the Paris historical axis. It starts with the statue of Louis XIV at the Louvre. It includes the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. It used to include the Palais des Tuileries, which has since disappeared. It goes through the Luxor Obelisk on the Place de la Concorde, up the Champs Élysées, and through the center of the Arc de Triomphe. Some other landmarks are too close to the ground for us to see. And then it goes through the Grand Arche de la Défense. And as we have seen, all of these monuments appeared at different times, but there was always a wish to line them up with the old royal road at the center of the Palace of the Tuileries, commissioned by Catherine de' Medici. So can we say that Catherine de Medici created the Paris historical axis? Well, not really. I think Le Nôtre had more to do um, with it because he had a thing for long perspectives and straight lines. The early French kings also, they love their straight road. So I don't know who gets the most credit. Lots of people do, you know, I'm sure. Someday, I think, the Paris historical axis will also include a large monument on the Place Nelson Mandela in Nanterre. So that's another city away from Paris. But I haven't heard anything specific yet. I think we'll have to wait for the next megalomaniac leader of France. <laughs> Because whoever that is will definitely fund something big. And... It will have to be big because for the perspective to work, the bigger the distance, the bigger the monument has to be. So, I mean, I don't know, the Grand Arche is 110 meters. Uh, that one is another 20 kilometers away. So pff, if you extend it that far, maybe you need a 300 or 400 meter tower or something. I don't know. It's, it, you know, to, to see it with a naked eye, it'd have to be really, really big. So if you want to see the Paris historical axis for yourself, go to the Louvre, stand in front of the statue of Louis XIV. If you can't see it from there, try it from the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. It's nearby. Then walk up the Tuileries Gardens and across to the Place de la Concorde and the Luxor Obelisk. And you could keep going up the Champs Élysées and to the Arc de Triomphe de l'Étoile. But that's where I usually get tired and hop on a bus up the Champs Elysees because I'm, I'm not a shopper. So if you are, walking might be nice. But for me, the bus is good enough. I go to the top on the bus and I get off and I look around. Whatever you decide to do, one thing is for sure. The Paris historical axis is a fun, silly thing to know about. And it's even better to see it in person. I've got all sorts of maps and photos for you to enjoy it vicariously on joinusinfrance.com and those will really help you visualize it. Thank you, Mike Capone, Sandra Hendricks, Roberta Burke and Erin Dombrowski for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. Wow, four new patrons in one week. That's not happened for a long time. So I'm glad you like the show. And my thanks to all the patrons who support the show month after month. You guys rock. To see the different ways you can support the show, visit joinusinfrance.com forward slash support. For my personal update, I have been calling tour members so I can get to know them a little bit. Tour members know me and Elise because they've been listening to the podcast, but we have no idea who you are until we meet you. So again, I'm delighted with the caliber of people who are coming on this tour and really look forward to spending time showing off my country to them. 
no other tour company that I know of gives you a chance to get to know the tour guides before you spend a week with them. And that makes a big difference because some of the tour guides I've met, I wouldn't want to spend more than an hour with them, let alone a week. I know most of you find the podcast because you have specific plans to come to France and you're looking for information on Paris or one of the many other places we've talked about. We're happy sharing all the info we know with you because we want you to have a fantastic time in France, whether you tour with us or not. So why do we even offer tours if our listeners are looking for information on how to tour by themselves? Well... Some of you want to come to France really badly, but you travel alone because your significant other doesn't like to travel as much as you do, or maybe you're single, or maybe you're widowed, or maybe you keep making plans to go, but they always fall through because, you know, life. Some of you travel with family and friends, but you don't have the time to put together a great tour because that's a lot of work. That's why we offer Addicted to France tours. And some of you also want to see France with a local. It's always better with a local, right? I know I don't sound like a French person right off the bat, but I am French, born and raised, and a French person with a Toulouse accent to boot. I, they think it's adorable in Paris. <laughs> and I play that for all it's worth. You know, you've heard of haughty waiters in France, whatever. Nobody's ever been haughty with me because I make them smile. That's, that's how I get what I want and what my customers want. So don't stay home because planning a trip to France is overwhelming or because you're worried about traveling alone. Come on our tour. We'll take great care of you and you'll see my France. And it's a great place to be. And make up your mind fast because May is coming out quickly. The Dordogne tour in the fall is already sold out and we won't offer another Paris tour until 2019. On a much darker note, uh, I also want to say thank you to all of you who've expressed condolences on the passing of my dog, Luna. I know it's just a dog, but I mentioned her on the show last week because she was being noisy while I was recording even though, you know, she was ne right next to me, and normally that was enough to calm her. She was almost 15, and she had been in really good health until last August. And then she developed major neurological problems, probably due to a brain tumor, but we didn't do the MRI to confirm the diagnosis because at her age, no matter what the cause was, the treatment was going to be the same, and there are no miracle cures. She spent the whole time I was recording last week being upset. She was growling softly. She was really, really anxious. And with hindsight, I realized that she was just a few hours away from totally losing control over her body. And by that, I meant, you know, she, was, she went from being able to get around with some assistance to having no idea what to do with her legs, where up and down was, unable to stand even for a second, and all of that within the span of two hours. I'm now dogless for the first time in 23 years. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see how I do with that. I'll be able to dedicate more time to the guide dogs now, so that's good. Anyway, be good to your pets. They bring so much into our lives, and they don't live long enough no matter how long they live. This is the French tip of the week. For the French tip of the week this week, I want to tell you about a very good French expression. That expression is, c'est tiré par les cheveux. C'est tiré par les cheveux. Literally, that means pulled by the hair or forced. If you drag someone by the hair, you are clearly forcing them, right? Anyway, the etymology went from pulled by the hair to forced to far-fetched. It's a really common expression that you may hear frequently in France because we're a bunch of skeptics who, upon hearing something, will naturally not believe it. <laughs> so here you go. C'est tiré par les cheveux. It's far-fetched. 
The best way to connect with me is via email, annie at joinusinfrance.com. There's also a phone number where you can call and leave a message. That's 1-801-806-1015. You can ask for trip advice at that number and I will answer it on the show. Or if you want to share any tips or any wonderful or awful experience, that's also the number to call, 1-801-806-1015. You can, ask, you can also ask your trip questions on the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook. It's a lively place with lots of helpful folks who know France well. I am making progress on the new website, getting to the point where I might launch it even if I haven't transferred as many of the episodes as I'd like because it's taking so long. Those of you who are subscribed to the podcast with whatever app you're listening to me right now will continue to have access to all the new and all the old episodes. Nothing will change for subscribers. But if you're not a subscriber, I recommend you do so because that way you won't miss any episodes even when I pull the trigger too soon on the website, which I'm bound to do because it's driving me nuts. Next week on the podcast, an episode with Elise that will be an overview of why you should also come visit our home in Toulouse. We're happy to meet you in Paris or Normandy, but get this, we have a wine bar in Toulouse that was voted the best wine bar in the world last year. And it's right next to a wonderful salon de thé or tea shop. Strangely, I've been to the tea shop many times, but I've never been to the wine bar. So I'll be dragging my dear husband there next weekend so we can test it. Poor husband. <laughs> anyway, I hope all of you have a wonderful week of planning your next trip to France or daydreaming about a trip to France. And do join us on a tour. You'll have the time of your life. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.